Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's meeting Jack was, was a real pleasure, and through that meeting, Gerard and the leadership here, and I was overwhelmed by the love um, shown in this community, and I'm, I mean that very sincerely. So, bless you, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I must just tell you that I was brought up in a Christian home, um, and, and my faith meant a lot to me, but I wandered away, I suppose, as many young people do. And I was brought to real faith through two of my own matric Latin pupils at St. Andrew's College. And I was thinking while we were singing Jesus is Alive, what happened was that I was an addicted cigarette smoker and I got a lump in my throat. And I knew these, some of these boys were Christians and I asked the one to pray for me and then he and his friend came for an extra lesson. Um, just after the doctor had told me he couldn't be totally positive that I didn't have throat cancer. And I was devastated. And I just poured out my heart to these two young men and they were amazing. They just listened. And right at the end of the evening I said to this boy called Hugh, won't you say a prayer? And he said, sure. And I shut my eyes expecting him to pray the, pray the Lord's Prayer and instead he said, Jesus, thank you that you've been here the whole time we've been talking. And I was very surprised. And I kind of let go, and I was sitting there with my eyes shut. And you know how it is when you're in a room and somebody turns the light on when you're trying to sleep and you can see it through your eyelids. But this was a man. And he was standing behind my desk. And I was so shocked. I thought it's true. And I was so pleased to discover Jesus is alive. And when this friend that Jack spoke about from England, Jeremy, had said to me he couldn't stop smoking and he asked Jesus to take away his desire to smoke, I thought, well, that's good enough for me. And I asked him to take away my desire to smoke because I was smoking 40 a day. And I went from 40 to nothing in three days with no withdrawal. And thank you, Lord. There's a traditional ancient greeting for Easter, and you probably know it, but just in case you don't, it goes like this. From very early times, Christians would greet each other on this morning by saying, Alleluia, Christ is risen, and the response would be, He is risen indeed, Alleluia. And I'm going to say the first part, and I want you to respond with, He is risen indeed, Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. I'm going to speak about the bigger picture. And forgive me if you've heard this before, but it's foundational. Where did the problem start? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And of course, we know that he threw the dragon, the serpent, Satan, the devil, out of heaven. Satan rebelled against God. And so, not being able to harm God, he messes with God's creation. And he tempted man to do the same thing. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about in Genesis chapter 3. We had a wise chaplain at St. Andrews who said to me one day, I think I know what this means. And I said, what? And he said, well, for instance, God says one thing, and Satan comes along and says, did God really say? I mean, if you took sex, for example, this wonderful gift for marriage, and Satan comes along and says, did God really say it was just for marriage? And we so stupid, we believe the enemy's silly lies. And we say, I will make up the rules because I know what is good and evil. And that's at the heart of postmodernism, isn't it? I remember with pupils in England saying to them, are you saying it might be wrong for me but not for you? And they said, yes. I said, well, if I go into the boarding house and steal your sound system, don't cry. 
because it might be wrong for you, but maybe it's not wrong for me. And postmodernism is just Genesis 3 in disguise. God could have left us there, but he begins a rescue plan through Abraham. Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, he gives some amazing promises. And then in Genesis chapter 15, when Abraham is in the land, and God says to him, do not be afraid, because there are probably five million Canaanites running around, I will be your shield. And Abraham does some very sharp talking and says, well, what good will that do me? Because you said you'd make a nation out of me and my wife's not even remotely pre pregnant and I've gone down and made plan B, which in those days was to adopt your favorite slave as your heir. And God says, no, step outside of your tent for a minute, count the stars. I'm going to make a nation out of you, as many as there are stars in the sky. But when he says to Abraham in verse eight, I think it is, excuse me. By the way, this land is yours. Abraham's faith takes a serious wobble. And he says to God, how can I know that it will be mine? And so God says, fetch a cow. And of course, you all know what he's going to do. Hands up those who know immediately what's going to happen. Okay, some of you, a few. Fetch a cow. <laughs> Extraordinary. What God is going to do is he's going to cut a blood covenant with Abraham. God is in effect saying, I know what you humans do when you don't trust each other. You make a blood covenant. Blood covenants date back to the beginning of time and they're still happening today. I can remember wanting to donate blood in Sunning Hill in 1998 and they asked a whole lot of questions designed to find out if you were an AIDS risk and the third question was, have you become blood brothers with anyone recently? And two young Hebrew men, if they made a blood covenant with each other, they would first of all exchange their garments and they were saying, exchange their robes, I'm giving myself to you. And then they would exchange weapons and they were saying, I will defend you to the death. And then they would cut their wrist or their arm and mix the blood and they would become of one blood. The scar that was remained was a reminder to whoever was making the blood covenant, I'm in covenant with somebody. And it would also be a warning to anyone who came to attack them. This has been in the human mind. I, I can remember at the age of seven becoming best friends. I can't even remember the other boy's name. We became blood brothers. We actually cut our wrists. And you can see on my wrist there's a little scar. Our parents would have had a bypass if they'd known what was going on. I mean, we could have bled to death. I don't know if that's the scar from it, but I like to think it is. But it's pathetic because you can't see it. In Africa today, they rub stuff into the scar to make it stand out. And then the he two Hebrew young men would do something very special to them. They would take a cow or a bull and split it down the backbone and form two walls of blood. And they would go for a walk through the pieces of the animal and they'd come face to face with each other. And what they were saying was, if I break this covenant, may God do this to me and worse. This is very serious. There's no way out of covenant except through death. You can't change your mind. And you would declare what you were going to do for your blood brother. These would be the terms of the covenant. There would be witnesses all around you. And you would call down curses on yourself if you were to break this covenant. All your unborn children would be taken into covenant with your blood brother. You see this with David and Jonathan. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, we're told that, that Jonathan took off his robe and gave it to David and took off his weapons, his sword and his bow and his belt and gave it to David. He's making a blood covenant with David. You exchange names, you put your names into each other. <clears throat> 
you very significantly had a covenant meal. You fed each other with bread and you were saying, into you I put me. And you fed each other with wine and you were saying, into you I put my lifeblood. And you would plant a tree as a reminder that you were in covenant with the other man. If you were in the desert and trees wouldn't grow there, you'd use a pile of stones. You see that in the covenant that Laban makes with Jacob. And very importantly, your attitude towards each other would be, it would be described by the Hebrew word chesed, which means covenant love. The King James Version translates it as mercy. The New American Standard gets the closest by calling it loving kindness. Um, but it's really covenant love. And Abraham knows exactly what to do. He fetches a cow and a, and a goat and a ram and a, and a bird, I think, and they split them down. He splits them down the backbone and he waits for God to arrive. But actually, God has to put him to sleep because he cannot walk through the pieces of the animal with Almighty God and survive. You, you will read that even, even in his deep sleep, fear and terror came over him. And two blazing lights passed between the animal, the pieces of the animal. And the one, I, I think, is God the Father, and the other is God the Eternal Son, taking Abraham's place. The scar was not in the wrist, but it was circumcision. And the name change was Abram becoming Abraham and Sarai, which means bitterness, becoming Sarah. The H out of God's name, Yahweh, is put into their names. And in future, they are known as the God of Abraham. God is known as the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac. One of the great promises of this covenant that is in your seed, and Paul points out it's singular, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God creates a nation out of Abraham. He has the promised son Isaac. Isaac has the two sons Esau and Jacob. The covenant goes through Jacob. You remember Joseph ending up as prime minister of Egypt. The family is taken to Egypt. God sets them free 400 years later from the tyranny of Pharaoh, who obviously represents the devil. Everyone in Egypt is a slave. It's just the Israelites who have a hard time. Because under Joseph, the Egyptians said to, to, um, to Joseph, we have no more money. And so he said, sell yourselves to the Pharaoh. God sets them free and takes them to Mount Sinai, and there he gives them the Ten Commandments. And I want you to, I just want you to stop for a minute, and I want you to just discuss with each other in groups of about three, not more than that, what you think the purpose of the Ten Commandments is. Just a couple of minutes. What do you think the purpose of the Ten Commandments is? If somebody had to come to you and say, what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? Just talk about that. What would you say? Okay, I can vividly remember spending a week at a Christian school in Kenya, St. Andrew's Turi, and the children there were the children of missionaries largely, so they were all Christian. And I asked them that question, I got the answer that I quite often get from congregations, something along the lines of a guideline for holy living, defining our duty to God and to our neighbor. And I said, fine, how well are you doing? and heads would go down all around the classroom. And I said, well, let's do a little test. And I want you, um, I, was, I was a school chaplain and I used to, to do this often in the divinity classroom. I want you just to test yourself because these boys would say to me, oh, well, I've, I've only ever worshiped one God. And I said, yeah, but have you ever made anything in your life more important than God? And they said, yes. I said, me too. That's commandments number one and two gone. I said, have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Have you always kept one day a week as a day of rest dedicated to the worship of God? No. Have you ever been rude to your parents? Hollow laughter all around the classroom. <laughs> 
Have you ever lied to them, deceived them? We get to number six, and a boy would say, well, I've never murdered anyone. You know, blood is of relief. I said, yeah, but 1 John 3 verse 15 says, if you've ever hated anyone, you're a murderer. Anyone here never hated anyone? Naught out of six. One boy in Kenya, I remember him vividly, saying, well, I've never committed adultery. And I should have said to him, well, I'm glad to hear it. You're only 15. <laughs> but I said, Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 27, if you've ever even imagined having sex with a girl, you've done it. So he went bright red and put his hand on. And the girls laughed at him and I said, that applies to you as well, naught out of seven. Ever stolen, ever said bad things about anyone behind their back. And number 10, of course, is the killer. Because number 10 says, not only must you not steal your neighbor's house, you mustn't even want to. Not only must you not commit adultery, but you mustn't even want to. Naught out of 10. I said, actually, the Ten Commandments are the terms of a covenant. We often forget that. They are the terms of what is known as the Old Covenant. Our English part of the Bible called the Old Testament, wrong name, Old Covenant. It's not a will, it's, it's a covenant, an unbreakable blood oath. There are curses attached to the breaking of the Old Covenant. I have never heard them read out in church, ever. Deuteronomy chapter 28, listen to this. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. The Lord will bless your towns and your fields, and it just goes on for 15 verses, the Lord will bless everything you do, the Lord will defeat your enemies, the Lord will bless your work and fill your bones. If you obey the Lord your God and do everything he commands, he will make you his own people, everything. But it then says in verse 14, but you must never disobey them in any way or worship and serve other gods. And then the curses begin in verse 15. But if you disobey the Lord your God and do not faithfully keep all his commands and laws that I'm giving you, all these evil things will happen to you. The Lord will curse your towns and your fields. The Lord will curse your corn crops and the food you prepare from them. The Lord will curse you by giving you only a few children, poor crops, few cattle and sheep. The Lord will curse everything you do. And I would say to these schoolboys, how many of you are beginning to wonder whether God is a God of love? And a few honest boys would put their hands up. And I said, don't make up your mind too quickly. Verse 20, if you do evil and reject the Lord, he will bring on you disaster, confusion, and trouble in everything you do until you are quickly and completely destroyed. He will send disease after disease. Not one of you left in the land that you're about to occupy. And so it goes on and on. And you can read it for yourself. And we get to the point where Verse 30, you will be engaged to a girl, but someone else will marry her. That used to shock the schoolboys completely. But it gets worse and worse. And then it gets to verse 45, and Moses, God through Moses says, all these disasters will come on you, and they will be with you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the Lord your God. And of course, we know with Israel, if you look at Genesis 24, when Moses reads out the terms of this covenant and throws blood on the altar and blood on the people, thus uniting them to God, twice they say, we will do everything the Lord our God has told us to do. They're so confident. And I can remember reading that as a young Christian, and I was just beginning to be aware of God's call to be holy and how badly I was failing. And I thought, how can you be so confident? And of course, they broke it within days or weeks with the golden calf, right? Commandments one and two broken. And God would have been justified in visiting all those curses upon them, but he doesn't. He gives them chance after chance after chance. And you could sum up the Old Testament in a way by saying, you know, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet to say to Israel, you are breaking the covenant. And if you read in the book of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says, 
we, he starts confessing the sins of his people. And he says, all the curses written in the book of Moses are coming upon us. Actually, the purpose of the law, Paul tells us, was very different. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. No one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. No one. What the law does is to make us know we have sinned. It's, Malcolm Smith described it as a mirror. You know, I might go on holiday for three weeks and not shave. And I might come back and think, I've got to go to work, I better shave, it doesn't feel too good. And then I look in the mirror and I thought, wow, I knew I was bad, but I didn't know I was that bad. Maybe some of you are sitting here today and saying, I knew I was bad, but I didn't know I was that bad. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, listen to this, an extraordinary statement. Law was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing. Wow. But where sin increased, God's grace increased much more. And then Romans 7, 13 and so by means of the commandment, sin is shown to be even more terribly sinful. The only person who's ever obeyed the Ten Commandments is Jesus. You know, if I had stood up in front of my wife because she was a kind person and said, I've never sinned, she would just smile. Nobody knows you like your marriage partner, right? Or if you're a teenager like your parents or whatever. Jesus got up in front of his enemies and said, which one of you can convict me of sin? And they were silenced. So in that case, he deserved the blessings of one, verses 1 to 14 in Deuteronomy 28. Because he's the only one who's kept the law perfectly. And what he does on the cross is he takes those curses on himself and offers us the blessing. Listen to Paul's words in Galatians chapter 3. Those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse. Why? Because we can't. You know that, that perfume advert which says, because you can? This is because we can't. If we're trying to be put right with God by what we do, Paul says we're under a curse. Very subtle to get back into that. You know, even Luther said that he found it difficult to come to God with his hands completely empty, without something to earn grace. Even Luther said that. John White said that he'd preached Romans for 25 years, but the full sweetness of, ne of it had never dawned on him until he was, realized that he was put right with, listen to this, he realized he was put right by, with, with God by what Jesus had come and not by the depth of his own surrender and not by his obedience. And we often, if you're anything like me, we beat ourselves to death on occasion. Because Paul says, why? The scripture says, whoever does not always obey everything that is written in the book of the law is under God's curse. And then he goes on to say, but by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us or bought us out from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. I can't prove this, but I don't think Paul understood grace completely when he was first converted in that dramatic meeting on, on the road to Damascus. Because you remember after a few months or so, the disciples said, you're going to get yourself killed. And they send him away. And he goes to, to Tarsus in Cilicia. And I think what God was doing during those years was breaking the idolatries of self-righteousness in Paul. You know, if Paul had said to God, why, why did you choose me, Lord? God might have said, because you're a worst case scenario. If I can get grace through to you, I can get it through to anyone. Because if anyone was trying to be put right with God by keeping the Lord, it was Paul. And what did it lead him into? Killing Christians. And I think that he was reading in Deuteronomy and he read this strange verse, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. And he's, he might have said to the Lord, but 
Jesus was hanged on a tree and the Holy Spirit might have said exactly. You mean he was under God's curse? Exactly. Christ did this, says Paul in Galatians, in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Christ Jesus so that through faith we might receive the spirit promised by God. The result of the blessing is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the blessing. Not only does Jesus take the curses, but he takes us out of the old covenant through death. And I used to say to schoolboys, we, we were in Jesus when he died on the cross, and I could see they thought the chaplain had lost his marbles. And I said, well, turn to John's gospel. Chapter 1, verse 14. You know, John talks about the word, the word, the word. The word was with God. The word was God. But in verse 14, it's clear that the word is Jesus. He lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son. And I said, let's go back to verse 3 and substitute Jesus' name. Through Jesus, God made all things. Not one all thing in all, in all creation was made without Jesus. And of course, every creation or invention begins in the mind of the creator. Excuse me. And so I'd say to them, but, but we all began in the mind of Jesus. We were in Christ. Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, I have been put to death with Christ on his cross. So he takes us out of the old covenant through death, thank God. And he takes us into a new covenant. And he cuts a new covenant on the cross. And the signs of covenant, you see the crucifixion is the cutting of a blood covenant. And the signs of covenant on the cross. First of all, there's the shedding of blood. And then there are the scars, at least five. One in each hand, one in each foot, and a spear wound in his side. And he chose to keep them. He didn't have to do that. Just in case we missed the point, five scars. The planting of a tree, of course, is the cross. But very significantly, the covenant meal, and it happened the night before. You remember Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body. Into you I put me. Wow. You know, don't, don't let, I, I, I remember, uh, and Herod will remember too, Dan Slade, who, who was, uh, I don't know if they're the same vocalists here, but I remember every time Dan pointed, pointed the microphone at somebody, they'd collapse in gales of laughter. And he was very naughty, and he said, I think we should have another worship song, and he turned around and pointed at the two vocalists, and they ended up back on the floor. He was very charismatic. But he gave a teaching, and he said, one of the bad results of the Reformation, and all the pastors pricked up there, you mean the Reformation had a bad result? He said, the diminishment of the power of communion. He said, Luther believed in the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. And he said, so do I. And all the pastors were doing goldfish impressions. See, Luther believed that. It was Calvin and Zwingli who took it off in another direction. He said the other one was the diminishment of confession. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll come back to that in a minute. The new covenant, the name exchange. He is the son of man and we become Christians. I've spoken about the blood covenant meal, but I didn't mention Jesus' words. This cup, you know, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. One lady said to me, I've heard that for 40 years every Sunday morning and it's gone straight over my head. And then the exchange of robes, he takes off his robe of purity and puts on himself the robe of our sin. But the crucial thing that we need to know is what are the terms of the new covenant and where can you find them? I found in Anglican churches and in non-Anglican churches, when I ask that question, people are at a loss. One of the most frequent answers is, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I said, but that's a summary of the law. And we just got naught out of ten. 
The only time Jesus was ever asked, what is it God wants us to do, is in John 6, 28. And he doesn't say, love God and love your neighbor. He says, the work of God is this, that you believe in the one he sent. In other words, give yourself to me, because until you do that, nothing. The second command comes in John 15. Love one another as I have loved you. Not love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because as one Carlos Ortiz says, if you don't love yourself, poor neighbor. Love one another as I have loved you. And I mean, that's a, a topic for another sermon. But the terms of the new covenant, I'd like you to think hard. Where are they? They're not the Ten Commandments, thank God. The terms of the new covenant and I'm going to ask for hands to go up if you got it right. It's either Jeremiah 31, 31 or Hebrews 8, verse 7. Did anyone come up with that? I'm going to read them out to you because Hebrews quotes Jeremiah. Hebrews is all about covenant. Hebrews 8, verse 7. If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, there would have been no need for a second one. I love that verse. It's so logical, isn't it? If we could keep the law, Jesus, you know, Paul said it as well. He said, if anyone can be put right with God through keeping the law, Christ died for nothing. If there'd been nothing wrong with the first covenant, there would have been no need for a second one. But there's nothing wrong with the law. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. And that's why in the next verse, the letter of Hebrews says, but God finds fault with his people not with the Ten Commandments. When he says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will draw up a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And by the way, the word for new in the Greek there is not naos, which just means soma new, but kainos, which means new, better, and different. And he says in verse nine, it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. And I hate to be obvious, but not like means not like. Because I was brought up effectively, and I'm very grateful for my parents and my upbringing and their faith, but it really was like the Old Covenant. Yes, there was forgiveness, but there was in the Old Covenant as well through sacrifice, and obviously pointing forward to Jesus' sacrifice. But the impression that I got as a teenager was try harder, and I knew I wasn't measuring up. And maybe there are people sitting here thinking, I'm not measuring up. No, of course you're not. Jesus measured up for you. Archbishop Bill Burnett, in his normal haughty way, he, he was a man filled with the Spirit and a great leader in the Anglican Church, baptized in the Spirit as a bishop, unilaterally, and amazing man. I had the privilege of knowing him. And, and he was a schoolboy at another Anglican church school called Michael House. And he said to me, when I was confirmed at Michael House, I became a Jew. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant the version of Christianity he'd been given was more old covenant than new covenant. Not like means not like. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. And God says he's going to do four things. And the first one you know, I'm going to start in reverse order. Verse 12, I will forgive their sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. And that's why I love communion, because it's the blood covenant meal. So when we come to communion, we give ourselves to Jesus and he gives himself to us and he reaffirms the promises of the new covenant. Because there's some of us who, who've sat and thought, I don't know how God's ever going to forgive me for that. And he knew we'd have that problem. And then just above that, they will all know me from the least to the greatest, a living relationship. You know about that. They belong to me. I will be their God and they will be my people. We're adopted into the family. But it's the first one they never told me as a teenager. I will put my law in their hearts, in their minds, and write them on their hearts. See, the Ten Commandments stand outside of us on stone and they say, obey me, but we fail. God says, I knew you'd have that kind of problem. I'm going to do an inside job on you. 
Ezekiel puts it in a clearer way. Amazing. Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to keep my commandments. I used to say to schoolboys, I had the privilege of, of leading 14, 15 year olds to Christ and we'd pray for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'd say to them, I want to see you the next day. Can't pray with somebody on Tuesday and then just leave them. And I'd meet them at break in the chapel and, and the first thing they needed reassuring with was that the gift of tongues they'd received, which they thought was normal Christianity, which it is. I'm not saying everybody has to receive it. I'm just saying that I think it's been diminished. It seems to me there's more the gift of falling over than receiving the gift of tongues and prophecy. And look, I know God does slay people in the spirit, and I've seen it genuinely, but I've also been pushed, and I've also seen it faked, and I think that's a terrible shame. I say to them, I want to see you in four days' time. And I always ask them the same question. How do you feel now when you sin? And one boy said, it's, oh, it's like a pain in the chest. Another boy said, it's like a knife. One boy actually said, I feel like vomiting. I said, brilliant. Not that you sinned, but that you are so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I said, the trouble with us older Christians is we've resisted the Spirit, and we don't have any peace left to disturb. Let the peace of Christ referee in your hearts, it says in Colossians. And a year later, I'd say to them, how much peace do you have now? And some of them had lost most of it. And I'd said, well, maybe you need to do this really difficult biblical thing and come and confess your sins out loud to God in my presence. James, confess your sins to one another. And I said to one evangelical congregation, I know you guys are falling over each other to confess your sins to one another, being naughty and stirring. But Dan Slade, and Herod will bear me out, said that many great ministries have ended in ruins because a leader hasn't felt accountable to somebody. And it was such a wake-up call for me too. And I thought, I better find somebody I can totally trust and walk in the light with them completely. Amazing terms. I just wanted to end, and you're probably saying, thank God, because he's going to go on forever. <laughs> but I just want to read you some verses from Romans and from 2 Corinthians. Because the new covenant is a ministry of the Spirit. Listen to Romans. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. It's only in the new covenant that there can be fruit. Having been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so we serve in newness of the Spirit, and not in oldness of the letter. And then from 2 Corinthians, Paul says to the Corinthians, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, shown that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy or good enoughness, you could say, comes from God, who also made us adequate or good enough as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. May we pray. Lord, thank you so much for your unbelievable rescue plan from the beginning. Before you even created us, you knew you were going to have to bleed and suffer and die and take the filth of the world upon yourself in order to get us back. It's very difficult for us to really grasp the enormity of what you've done. <clears throat> 
But Lord, we, we just pray that you would give us understanding more and more and help us to give away to others all the grace and the mercy that you give us. We pray this in your name. Amen.